Hello and welcome to lecture number six. I'm sorry about the picture. I couldn't find a good motion related picture, but this is being posted to the internet so cute cats are always appropriate. So we're going to spend most of this lecture practicing using the UAM equations, which we'll do more in class, but first let's just have a look at understanding them a little better. So let's start with this one. We know we're talking about constant acceleration. And if you look at the form of this, if you think of the final velocity as being something where if we know the initial velocity and the acceleration, then we can find this for all times, then this is just a linear equation, y equals mx plus b. And so this is saying something that we sort of already know, that for constant acceleration, v versus t is a straight line on the graph. Now, you can take that view here as well. If you think of x, the final x, as something where if you know all these others, the in initial x, the initial velocity, and the acceleration, you can now find later positions at all times. The form of this is the same as a parabola. And so all this is saying is that the x versus t graph is a parabola. The third one is a little more difficult. If you rearrange it like this, you can see that this is saying that v as a function of position is like a square root. To develop a strategy for using these equations, you need to understand something about their structure. So the first thing I'm going to draw your attention to that I've made easier to see by color is that wherever one of the x's appears, the other one also appears. Or to put it another way, we always have delta x appearing wherever the x's are. Because see, here we could just subtract xi from both sides and have delta x here. And delta x is just xf minus xi. So let's treat the x's as one thing and notice that it appears in those two equations. The initial velocity appears in all three equations, but the final velocity only appears in these two. The acceleration appears in all three, but the time difference, the time interval, only appears in those two. And so now look, each of these is an equation in four variables. We have four variables each. Now that, that gives us a strategy. Anytime we know three things, we can find an equation that will tell us a fourth. Let's do a quick, simple example to get our bearings here. So you drop a ball. At the instant you drop it, it's at rest. How far does it fall in the first two seconds after it leaves your hand? And the first thing you should always do is draw a picture to summarize your thoughts. So here I've done that. The ball is here at the beginning, and here's its final position. And the very important thing to do when you draw a picture is to set your axes. So notice, I've set the ball's initial y position to zero, and I've set y positive down. And the reason I've done that is I know the whole motion will be down. And so if I set positive down, then I will have no negatives at all to deal with in the whole problem. So the next thing I'm going to do, and again you should always do this, is I'm going to write down all of what I know and what I don't know so that I can strategize. And I'm leaving off the subscripts y. I know everything is along the y-axis, so I don't need them. All right, so it seems like the question doesn't tell you much, but in fact, we know a lot. I've set my axes so that the initial y is 0. That was my choice, but it's a convenient choice. But I could have done it other ways. yf is actually what I'm looking for. vi. Well, we know that. It's at rest at the instant you drop it. So that's zero. But I don't know anything about yf. Now, it doesn't say what the acceleration is, but in fact, we know it. This is free fall, and we've discussed free fall. 
we know that the acceleration is g down. Okay, and I've set down as positive, so it's 9.81 meters per second squared. Positive, because down is, po is positive. Now, I'm going to use 10, just to make the mental math easier. And throughout the course, except in the lab, feel free to just use 10. And delta t we're given. We're looking for where this is two seconds after it leaves your hand. There we go. So now look at what we've got. We want to know delta y. And we know vi. And we know a. And we know delta t. So we need to find an equation that includes those four. The equation that includes all of those is the second equation. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to write down the equation I'm going to use. And again, you should always do this without plugging in numbers, partly because you can save yourself some work in the next step, but partly so that anyone reading your solution sees what you're up to. They see what equation you've chosen. So there's my equation, and look, I can simplify things. Yi is zero, so that's gone from the equation. Vi is zero, so that whole term is gone from the equation. I've just saved myself a whole lot of work. There is what I can now use. And the thing you're looking for isn't always solved for, but in this case, it's already solved for, so I can just go ahead and plug in my numbers. And notice that I'm putting the units in so that I can check that I haven't made a unit error. Seconds squared, seconds squared, cancel. And I'm going to be left with something in meters, which is good because y had better be in meters. And so that's just going to be 4 to 20 meters. It falls 20 meters in those two seconds. Okay, now let's do a beefier example. So we have a train, and it starts from rest, and it travels 120 meters while accelerating at 4 meters per second squared. Then it moves for 5 seconds at constant velocity, and we want to know how far it's gone in total. So I've started a pictorial representation of what I know here. Here's the starting position. I've set my axes so that it's starting at the origin. And I've indicated that 120 meters, and I'm going to further indicate that during this time period, we know that we have an acceleration of 4 meters per second squared. And I'm going to call that A0. And I'm going to say T0 is the starting time here. I'll call that one 0. And we have a T1 here, and a T2 at the end. Let me just sketch an x versus t graph. We don't know a lot of detail, but we know enough to sketch something. We know that initially it is moving with an acceleration. It's speeding up in this case. And so x versus t has to get steeper for a while. But then then it moves at constant velocity and so there's a straight line portion later and this time here where there's the, the switch that's t1 and let's say out here here's t2 where we know that this is five seconds and we don't know how long this time is but here's t0. Now, one thing to notice right away is we don't have uniformly accelerated motion because the acceleration has one value here, and out here, I'll call it a1, it's zero. The acceleration changes. However, we're not stuck because each piece of the motion is uniformly accelerated. So we can use the UAM equations to get from, from T0 to T1 
and then we can use them again to get from t1 to t2. What we can't do is use the equations to get straight from t0 to t2. That's impossible because they don't know what to do with a changing acceleration. So I'm just going to summarize a few more things here. I have a v, an initial v, I'm going to call it v0 because it's v at t0 and it's 0. We have a v1, well we don't, we don't know what it is. We don't know v2. I'm going to call this x0, x1, x2. And so I'm just using my diagram to define symbols. So I'm going to take a slight pause while I write all the symbols down, and then we'll start finding them. Okay, so I've taken a little pause just to transfer this into a summary down here because this is going to make it easier to strategize. And you should check that you agree with all these values I've put in. I just want to point out this x1 is the same as this x1 and this v1 is the same as this v1. Whenever you define a symbol use it for only one quantity and I've stuck to that. Never never use one quantity for two different or one symbol for two different quantities. All right. So now we need to strategize. And one thing to look at is that ultimately what we want is x2. But we don't know enough to solve anything for this time period. All we know is the acceleration and the time interval. We don't know delta x and we don't know either of the v's. We need three things. But if we could find v1, we'd be good and we can get v1 over here because we do know three things here. We know a, we know delta x, we know v0. So we're going to use an equation that combines v1, v0, a, and delta x, and that's the third equation. So I'm again going to write it down. I'll write it in the symbols I'm using. Oh, that's a0. And I'll call this delta x1, 0. That's x1 minus x0. Okay. And again, I'm not going to put any numbers in until I've totally solved for what I'm looking for, which is v1. And I have a simplification. v0 is 0. So there we go. I can now plug in numbers. So I now encourage you to just pause the video for a moment, plug in the numbers, and get the answer. All right, so I've done a little unit check. Meters per second squared times meters gives us meters squared per second squared. That's all inside a square root. And so we wind up with meters per second, which is what we better wind up with. And the numbers come out to 31 meters per second. So now we can go on and finish. This v1 we now, is, now know is 31 meters per second. And so here we now want delta x. We have v1, a, and delta t. And the, the second equation will get that for us. So again, I'll write it down in the symbols that I'm defining. And there's an immediate simplification that this acceleration is zero. And so all I've got is this. So once again, pause the video and get the numbers. There we go. And I've done a little bit of a unit check to see that it comes out to meters. And there's the final number. I will see you in class and we'll practice more of these.